the, uh, my sickness and, and things that happened have kind of uh, shifted uh, the way I'm going to do this uh, for the next couple of weeks. Uh, I, I will tell you, though, I'm going to tell you what I'm convinced of. Um, I've had several in this church tell me the last sermon that we had here was the sermon I preached on hell. And I have had several in this church tell me, Pastor, you stirred up something and the enemy uh, came against you and tried to, uh, tried to silence you and tried to quiet you because you preached something that was the truth. And if you heard that sermon, you know uh, it was not your typical hellfire and brimstone sermon. That's not the kind of preacher I am. If you didn't hear that sermon, you need to go back and listen to it. Uh, God has used that sermon. It is now, I think it's like almost 1,500 views. Um, God is doing something. Again, I didn't preach that if your hair was too long, you were going to hell. Or, you know, if you, you, know, if you did one of the social vices that, that are in this country that you were going to go to hell. I just simply preached about the reality of it and what will you will experience there. Now, the, uh, on the flip side of that, starting next week, my goal is to start, I'm going to preach at least a couple of sermons on, on heaven. Uh, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. We have no idea how good heaven is. And, 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 and uh, just as awful as hell is, and the Word teaches us, the Word teaches us just how great heaven is. And we need to know that truth because not only do we need to know what God is delivering us from, we need to know what God is taking us to. Amen? So I want to tell you, if you've, if you've uh, you need to be here. You need to be here the next couple of weeks. And, and, and for those that are watching that are normally here, that are staying at home, again, because of, of safety and health concerns, um, the, the church is, uh, we did sanitize, we did clean, and, and hopefully next week everybody will be back and, and we'll continue to move forward. Because I'm going to tell you, I, I, I will say this, and I want to say this, but I want to be very careful about how I say this. Um, just because the world is having a pandemic does not change the purpose of the church. Just because the world is in a mess doesn't change what should be our message. Amen? And just because we are going through a test should not change our testimony. Amen? Uh, and so, so we are going to, we're looking at ways and being creative about ways we can, can reach out and do what we need to do because the mandate hasn't changed. We are still to be the church. Amen? And so I want to talk to you this morning. I, I, the Lord has moved on me over the last couple of weeks as I've been laying in bed and fighting chills and cold and cough and all those kind of good things. And as I recovered, um, God brought and dropped in my spirit. I want to tell you something, and I want you to listen to me and be very careful. I, I want to be very careful about my words. The church is still alive and well. Listen, I want to tell you something. I know the statistics. I'm a pastor. I see the statistics. I know how many churches every week in America shut down. I know how many buildings closed their, let me rephrase that, not churches, buildings. I know how many buildings close their doors every week and every month. I know how many pastors give up every month. I know how many pastors, uh, the, the, newest, the newest thing is for some reason, I don't understand it, but pastors and pastors' family over the last couple of years have been several that you have seen that have taken their own life and ended their life because of the depression or the battle or the, the struggle that they were in. It was just too much and they felt like they couldn't go any further. Can I tell you something that, that I'm not, I'm not going to bash them, I am not going to talk bad about them in any way. But I think that oftentimes when we are in the midst of the struggle, the old saying is we can't see the forest for the trees. And it, sometimes it seems like that the battle is out there and it's more and it's greater than we could ever accomplish. And that it is harder and that the enemy is stronger and that the world is winning. But can I tell you, we are not meant to fight the battle. David said the battle is the Lord's and if he be for us, then who can be against us? Against us, folks, the Bible believing, Bible teaching body of Christ is still alive and well, and there is nothing the world can do to stop that. Oh. Listen, I know the statistics. Not only about how many churches are closing and all those kind of things, I know the statistics of what has happened since the pandemic and how many people that used to go to church have not. Let me, I'll just go ahead and tell you so that way I can just 
prove it to you that I do know. It's 82%. 82% of people who went to church on a regular basis up until March when the quarantine happened, 82% have not watched a single online service of their own church or any church. 82% have not watched. Can I say, I want to be very careful about how I say this, but uh, this I want us to understand. That uh, I said, if I bring me a it's your buddy that sent me a video this last week, that is the beginning of a shaking. Can I tell you, there is a beginning of the shaking in the body of Christ. And what we're finding out right now is that we're finding out that those who aren't the true believers, we're finding them to start to fall away. The scripture calls that in 2 Thessalonians or 1 Thessalonians, the apostasy, the falling away. But the scripture also talks about to those who are the true believers, there's a revival that is coming. And folks, I want to tell you what. God is doing is there is a shaking going on in the body of Christ and those who are true believers those who really don't believe we're finding them starting to fall away but for those who are blood bought saints and child children of the living God we're finding something beginning to stir in them I find every person that I talk to in this church listen I'm not saying that we are something special but every person I talk to in this church I find in them they talk about something that they feel a stirring on the inside of them. Like it's only happening in them, but it's happening in this church. Folks, can I tell you what's going on? That God is beginning to separate the wheat from the tares. And those that are the true born again, Bible believing children of God, God is moving and stirring in them and doing something that He is bringing about His final plan in this world. I gotta slow down. I'm not fully recovered. Hold on. Seeing stars. I gotta be honest with you. I gotta let me get my breath. Okay, I'll try to slow down if I can. Mm. Are you in Ephesians chapter two? Are you there? I want to read. I want to read a couple verses to you, and then then we're gonna we're gonna put it into context because I'm all about context. Okay, Ephesians chapter two, starting at verse twenty. Starting at verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth up into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also, also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. I, I've read that verse, I can't tell you how many times. The idea of God bringing together his body. The idea of God bringing together the building. The idea of God bringing together uh, uh, his, his habitation. I'll get to that point in just a minute. But this last week, the Lord began to put it in context for me. And, I, and I, began to, I began to look at something. I want you to flip back to Ephesians chapter 1. Something that I had really never seen before. That we have to understand that, that yes, this is the body of Christ. But according to 1 Corinthians, Paul said that the body is made up of the individual members. That each of us, each of us create. Each of us add to. Each of us are a part of. Each of us are the body of Christ according to 1 Corinthians, according to the scripture. That each of us, it's not the whole idea that the body is all of us. We've got to understand that the body is each of us. I make up the body of Christ. You individually make up the body of Christ. And then we together make up the body of Christ. Does that make sense? So that not, it's not that the body of Christ or the church is some big conglomeration of a group of people. The body of Christ is individual people that then come together. And when they come together, they then add to and create the body of Christ. Are you with me? Uh, can I show you this from the scripture? I want to just take, I'm going to real quick, I want to real quick, because I want to be quick, because i got something else I want to do. Um, if you go to Ephesians, starting at chapter 1, I'm going to go through some verses really, really quick, but I want you to get this. In verse 1, he talks about to the saints, that's plural. Verse 2, grace be to you, that's plural. 
Verse 3, our Lord who has blessed us, that's plural. Verse 4, he has chosen us, that we, that's plural. Verse 5, having predestinated us, that's plural. Verse 6, made us accepted, that's plural. Verse 7, in whom we have redemption, that is plural. In verse 8, he hath abounded toward us, that is plural. Verse 9, made known unto us, that is plural. Verse 11, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, that's plural. That we should be, verse 12, to the praise, that's plural. Verse 13, verse 13, in whom you trusted, that's singular. After that, you heard the word of truth, that's singular. The gospel of your salvation, that's singular. In whom also after you believed, that's singular. And you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, that is singular. Which is the in earnest of our inheritance, black to plural. You see what I'm getting at? It's the idea, Paul doesn't make a distinction with the body of Christ and the body of Christ. Are you with me? He does not make a distinction of the body as a whole with individuals and the body as an individual that part of the whole. Are you with me? See, what you've got to understand is as the individual goes, so goes the body. And Paul does not make a distinction between the body of all of us and individuals as part of the body. Am, am I making sense? Can I continue? I, I, I want to. I got to drive this point home. I want you to get this. Verse fourteen, our inheritance, plural. Verse fifteen, your faith. That's singular. Verse sixteen, give thanks for you. That is singular. Making mention of you in my prayers. That is singular. That God would give you, that is singular, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That the eyes of your understanding, verse 18, that is singular. That you may know, that is singular. What is our inheritance in the saints, that is plural. And the power, verse 19, to usward, that is plural. And he has put all things under his feet and made him the head of all things to the church. And he is him that filleth all in all, which is both singular and plural. Paul is not making a distinction between the individual as part of the body and the body as a group of individuals. Are you, it, it, I'm, I know I'm repeating myself, but I want you to get this because here's the point about all of this is that each of you matter because as you go, so the body goes. Not just the pastor. Yes, I understand that because I'm the pastor and I'm the one that sees everybody and I live here and all, the, and all my involvement in this building, I know that for the last two Sundays, for everybody's safety and health, that we, we decided not to have service because we wanted to make sure that everything was clean. I get that. And so the pastor was sick and that made a huge impact on the church. In fact, we didn't even have church. I understand that it makes a huge impact when the pastor is sick. But can I tell you something? It makes a huge impact when you're sick. See what I'm saying? See what I'm driving at? Paul did not make a distinction of the health of the body of Christ as a group. He did not separate it from the health of the body of Christ of each individual. You matter. You matter. Not just the pastor. Not just the worship leader. Not just the youth pastor, not just the children's pastor. You matter. Every one of you. Every, each and every one of you. I have said this before. I want us to, even in how Christ died. Christ did not die for all. Christ died for each. And in dying for each, he then died for all. But if he didn't die for each, if he didn't die for every single one of us, then he didn't die for any of us. And so we have to understand. And so can I tell you? I'm going to tell you why I believe the church is alive and well. While I was down, while I was down, I had, I had, we had people come to this church and walk this church and pray for us. And I want to tell you, I am convinced. I am, you cannot convince me. 
you cannot convince me otherwise that I am standing here today with my wife and my mother-in-law and my daughter in attendance in this service because of the prayers of the people of this church. I am convinced of it. Because I'm going to tell you, I was sick. But I'm convinced. I told Christy, I told Christy yesterday, I am convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that because of the faithful prayers and concerns of the body, each and every individual member, I did not get a text from Spirit Walk Church. I got a text and emails and phone calls and messages from individuals in this body. And because of that, I'm going to tell you, it made a difference in the life of this man. I want to tell you, I, 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 I am so... I, uh, in fact, I'm going to pick on one because he's here and I can and he'll let me. Lewis Shippen, you don't know. You don't know what making that phone call meant to me and getting that doctor to call me. He called me. I, didn't I haven't told you about this conversation. He called me on Friday night a week ago. And for about 10 minutes, he asked me questions. How are you doing? Give me the symptoms, this kind of stuff. For about 10 minutes. But the conversation, the phone call lasted for 35. For about 10 minutes, he asked me questions. For about 25 minutes, I had an ER doctor pray over me. And he prayed in the spirit. And he prayed with understanding. And he encouraged me. And he gave me scripture. And he told me that if God be for me, then who can be against me? He told me I'm an ER doctor, but God still heals. And I believe in it. And I'm going to tell you, if you will walk by faith, God will take care of you. And what God what prompted that phone call was a brother in Christ by the name of Lewis Shippen who said, I'm going to call my friend and have him check on my pastor. And he called me. Cyrus called me Friday night. He called me Saturday. He texted me Saturday. He called me last Sunday. He texted me last Sunday. He called me Monday and he sent me an email Monday. And, I, and then he called me Tuesday and he said, tell me how you're doing. And we went through it and he said, sounds like you've got this thing pretty much licked. You call me if you need me. You've got my number of, and otherwise I'm going to to leave you alone now and I want to tell you Lewis you don't know what that meant to me I'm convinced the church is alive and well why because there are God fearing God believing blood bought children of God who are in this church and if we, if we are here then there is nothing that can stop what God is going to do in us with us through us by us and for us he still has a plan and God still will accomplish what he means to do I'm convinced of it. I don't care what the statistics say. I don't care what the statistics are. I don't care how many other churches close down. I don't care about other churches losing. And, and I do, don't get me wrong, I do care. What I'm saying is I'm not phased by it. So that makes it uh, maybe that's a better way of saying it. The church is alive and well. Why? Because we are still a group of blood bought believers in Jesus Christ in whom you trust in whom you believed, in whom your salvation, in whom your inheritance, in whom you've been sealed, and because you've been sealed, and because you believe, and because you have hope, and because you've trusted him, what, the, what makes the difference is when you believe, and you've got all that, then when we come together, God begins to work and move and bring us together in such a way that we all add to the body of Christ, and he begins to build according to a Ephesians chapter 2, his holy habitation. I'm going to tell you, the church is alive and well in Pine Level, Alabama because there are individuals who are alive and well in Christ. And when those individuals who are alive and well in Christ come together, the scripture says he begins to use them to build his church to make a holy habitation through the Spirit. I know this is not my typical sermon. I'm using a little more A, B, C, D, let's go through. I, I just, I'm just sharing from my heart. Because can I, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. I know, because I talk to other pastors, I know other churches struggle. I know other churches.
are having issues. I know other churches, and I'm not trying to disparage them in any way, but I want to tell you something. When God's children come together in a place where there is no jealousy, there is no envy, there is no strife, there is nothing but peace and harmony, then what happens is God gets in the midst of that and he said where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst also. And when God is he will accomplish what he intends to accomplish. It doesn't matter who's behind the pulpit. It doesn't matter who's singing the songs. It doesn't matter what the songs are. Truthfully, it really doesn't matter what the sermon is as long as it's from straight from the Word of God. If he is here, see, it's not about the preacher and it's not about the singing and it's not about the songs. If he is here, and that's exactly what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, is that when we come together, he builds a holy habitation for the presence of the almighty God through the person of the Holy Ghost. And when he does that, I've skipped a part, I hadn't gotten to it yet, but I, I, I'm going to, in fact, Ephesians chapter 2. I want to be down there, I want to be up here. I don't know what to do. I want to show you this. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 12. That at that time, ye being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes, you being individual, I'm going to go back to singular, were afar off, were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, for he is our peace. I'm, I'm going to make a point on that in just a second. Who hath made both one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinance, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Let me tell you what. Let me tell you what I what the Lord dropped into my spirit about this whole thing. Now I know that that particular passage of scripture is referring to Jews and Gentiles, in particular. But let me give you the principle. It says those that were afar off. And those who are close to him. That through the cross, he has abolished the enmity between them. And, ab and abolished the wall of separation between them. And has brought them together and made them one new man. Let me tell you what the principle is when it comes to the body of Christ today. We've got them out there that are afar off. They don't know the Lord. They don't come to church. They're not saved. They, they don't, they, they've not given their heart and life. Jesus and we that are in here we're the ones that are nigh what God is doing is I, we got to get past uh, 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 um, I, I was told uh, Christy told me yesterday don't preach politics so okay let me let me be very careful about this uh, I, I want to uh, she's been fussing at me about that saying I've been too political behind the pulpit um, listen if we listen to my words very carefully right here if we as a group of believers, as the body of Christ, if we will not worry about preaching a social justice gospel, if we'll not worry about preaching a culturally relevant gospel, if we'll not worry about preaching a Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter gospel, if we'll just come together and preach the gospel, and focus on the cross of Jesus Christ and what he has done and the fact that I was a sinner but I am no longer a sinner the cross changed my identity and has made me a brand new man and if we can go out there not with a social justice gospel not with a culturally relevant God the gospel is relevant I don't have to make it relevant it is still relevant for today why because we are still a group of people who struggle with sin in the flesh and so do they and the only hope that they have is the cross of Jesus Christ and if we can preach that message it will break down the walls 
And we don't have to worry about how we're going to reach them. We'll reach them. How? With the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. That he was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He owed, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could never pay. And at the cross he paid and he died for my sins, but he didn't stay dead. Three days later, the stone was rolled away, and Jesus Christ walked out alive so that I could not only have victory over sin, but I, that I could live life and live it abundantly. And then he stayed for another 50 days. He encouraged the brethren. He gave them the Holy Ghost. He ascended to the right hand of the Father and sits there today. And if we will focus on that and focus on Jesus my friend the church 20 years from now if God tarries the church will still be alive and well why because of the preacher no because of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the cross God I feel this I've talked about it, I've talked about this, and I've had some people tell me to shut up and quit saying it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I know I'm not the most creative. I never come up with the catchy sermon titles, right? I'm just not good at that. And I never, you know, all the guys that have got their little snippets, and they were able to put it together, and it's so, and I listen to them, I'm like, oh, that's so smart, and that's so good. I'm not, listen, I don't have to be good at that. You know what I'm called to do? Tell people about that thing right there. And if I, as your pastor, <laughs> preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, and the fact that Jesus Christ and him crucified is the only hope for my life and for your life and for their life, and we go out and we do the same as a body of believers, it will tear down the walls and we will find people being one new man brought together as the body of Christ being brought together and made a habitation for God. Why? Because we got the right music? No! Because God is here! Because we preach Christ and Him crucified. Amen? Tell me that makes sense. So what happens? Let me go. How am I doing? I need to stop, don't I? Probably. Okay. Let me take two minutes. Oh, okay, maybe five. Uh, why don't you turn to Matthew chapter 16. I preached on this passage before, but I want to go back and visit it just one more time. I want to show you this. Matthew chapter 16, starting at verse 13. While you're turning, I'm going to get me a drink so I can finish this sermon. You got, I got I to gotta get this part. Are you with me so far? Are, are we good? Is, is it okay if I, as your pastor, I just recommit to you, I'm going to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified? Because I'm going to tell you, any amount of learning or smarts that I may have will never change a life. The only thing that will set the captive free, the only thing that will save a soul, the only thing that will heal a body, the only thing that will bring deliverance, the only thing that will change a family and a home, the only thing is the cross and Christ and him crucified and risen again. Amen? Matthew 16, starting at verse 13. Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, and he asked the Whom do men say that I am? Keep going. And they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias and others, one of the prophets, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, keep going. And he said to them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter, my buddy Simon, answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed that unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, this rock of my the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Flip back there. I know, get, go, uh, go back to the first part. Upon this rock I will build my church. 
Now, I preach this passage of Scripture, and I want to give it just right quick, that there are, there are three interpretations, or two interpretations, main interpretations, of what that means when he says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The first interpretation, which is the one that the Catholics take, is when he says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the word Peter is the word Petros, which means stone. And so the one interpretation of this passage of Scripture is that the church is built upon Peter. That is the one the Catholics take. Um, the other interpretation of that passage of Scripture, that that particular verse is when he says thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church is that upon this rock is the revelation that Peter gave that you are Peter or you are Christ the son of the living God that's the second one that's the more predominant one I want to throw another idea at you um, he, he took his disciples it was a 32 mile round trip 32 miles and they didn't have car they went by foot they had to walk 16 miles they got to Caesarea Philippi he gets to Caesarea Philippi and he asked the question whom do men say that I am he could have asked that in Jerusalem very easily very easily he wanted to make a point let me tell you about Caesarea Philippi Caesarea Philippi was the Las Vegas of the area it was 16 miles Caesarea Philippi was a, a just entrenched in idolatry and in that area they worshiped a god named pan pan was half man half God. and so they had all of the sexual sins that you could think of uh including bestiality was done in caesarea philippi it was it was awful it was i mean it was you know the whole idea of what happens in vegas stays in vegas caesarea philippi was that kind of a place and so <clears throat> And, and they, uh, uh, one of the major attractions that they had was one temple to the goddess Diana. But another thing that was unique about Caesarea Philippi was Caesarea Philippi was up on a rock. The city was up on top of a dome of a rock. And in Caesarea Philippi, there was a cave, and out of that cave came a stream. And that cave was believed to be the entrance and exit where the gods would come out of Hades or come out of Mount Olympus, and they would come into earth, and they entered earth through this cave at Caesarea Philippi, and it was called the Gate of Hell is what it was called, or the gate of Hades. That's what they referred to it as. And so the, the gate, uh, the, 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 the stream that came out of that cave is no longer around. They had a huge earthquake back a little after 70 AD, and the stream cut off because the land changed and all that kind of stuff, but the cave is still there. And so that cave was called the gate of hell, and it was the city was up on a rock. And so they walked 16 miles to Caesarea Philippi, and I got a funny feeling they walked up on that rock, and they stood in front of that cave. They were within sight of that gate. Are you with me? And he gets in front of that gate, and he's on that rock, and he says, whom do men say that I am? And they said, some say Elias or Isaiah or some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And I just got a funny feeling that Jesus said, you are Peter, but on this rock I will build my church. I think God put, I think Jesus walked them out to Caesarea Philippi in the worst area of, that was around. Caesarea Philippi was the worst area. Think of, again, think of Sin City. Think of Las Vegas. Think of Atlantic City. Think of uh, downtown, the red light district. Think of those kind of things. That was Caesarea Philippi, and they were open about it. A lot, of their, a lot of their orgies and parties were done during the day in daylight. They just, and, and they was out there for all to see. And I think in the middle of all that, Jesus Christ walked his disciples and said, listen, it may look bad. Listen, it may be ugly. Listen, they may be doing all kinds of debauchery. They may be the worst of the worst. This may be the worst of the worst. But can I tell you, in the middle of the worst of the worst, upon this rock, I will build my church. Do you know where one of the first churches that the church established after Christ went up to heaven and ascended was in Caesarea Philippi? And I got a funny feeling that Peter and James and John when that church was established remembered back to Jesus Christ standing in that spot and said it may look bad but upon this rock I will build my church folks can I tell you something America is in trouble things may look rough but in the middle of the worst of the worst of the worst 
Christ is still in the business of building his church. The church is alive and well. I know it looks bad out there. I know it looks rough out there. I know it seems like to some of us politically, I don't care which way you lean, that the enemy is winning. If you watch CNN, the Republicans are winning. If you watch Fox, the Democrats are winning. I don't give a rip about any of that. I don't care about any of that. Listen, I'm going to tell you what's going on out there. There is a world, there is a nation, there is a state, there is a county, and there is a city that is eat up with sin. The worst that you can imagine. It's bad out there. But if we go out there with the message of Jesus Christ upon this rock right here in Pine Level, Alabama, Christ will build his church. Amen? How? How? When we as individuals it's not this. I told you this about three or four weeks ago. That one of the great, one of the bad things about modern technology, one of the bad things about it, is that I think it's made the body of Christ lazy. Because if we can get the right preacher who can tickle their ears, and we got the right kind of music, and it's all so good, and it tickles their ears, that we'll build a crowd. Listen, let me tell you something. This pandemic has put all that out. It's not about having the right preacher or the right, and we need to have, I want to be the best preacher I can be, and it's not about having the right musicians, although our musicians are great, it's not about that, it's about when we as individuals, when we come together as blood bought, set free, redeemed, anointed, spirit filled, individuals, children of God, when we come together, and then the body of Christ, and then God sets his habitation through the spirit in the middle of that. Folks, let me tell you something. He will tear down walls. Oh, stand with me. I gotta, I gotta stop. I gotta stop. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go this long. I've asked you this for the last four services I know of, but it's been three weeks, so I'll remind you again. Two weeks, excuse me. Three weeks. It's, it's not about, and we do Facebook, and I'm so glad people are watching by Facebook, and I want them to watch. I want to get the word out any and every way that we can, and thank God for that technology. Thank God for that ability. I'm so glad, but listen, let me tell you, Facebook is not going to grow this church. What's going to grow this church? I'm not, truthfully, I'm not really all that worried about growing the church. What's going to enlarge the kingdom of God, that's what I want, is when we as individuals, we get free. We get delivered. We get on fire. We get convinced that if God be for us, then who can be against us? And then we go out, that, out there with that message of Jesus and the cross and victory and power and hope and peace and a joy and strength and all of those things. We take that out there as the body of Christ. God will begin to tear down the petition between us. Amen. I'm going to tell you, I'm convinced. I'm convinced because of the prayers, the text, the calls, the messages. I've had people in this church, I've had men in this church, and I know men, I know, I, I men, I, you know, I get it, we're men, and, and, you know, a lot of that ooey gooey, mushy gushy stuff is not for us, I get it. I've had men in this church call me and message me and tell me they're praying for me and tell me they love me, and I know that they meant it. I know that they meant it. Why? Because I'm a great guy? No. 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 Because they, as a child of God, felt the love of God for another brother in God and shared love and hope and their prayers and their concerns for the brother who needed it. And I'm convinced because of that, 
I'll pick on Robbie for a second. Robbie works a lot of weekends and is not able to be here a lot. He was one of the ones that checked on me the most. Say, hey man, how you doing? Just check it on you. And if you know Robbie, if you were to talk to him, and, and with more than just, a, that's probably all you'd get out of him. Hey man, just checking on you, how you doing? Because he just doesn't talk a lot, he's just not a talker. And I know a couple of times, I know a couple of times he messaged me from work. When he's busy in the ER, he took time to pick up his phone and just shoot a message. Hey, brother, just thinking about you. How you doing? I could name others who come here early in the morning before anybody knows and walks this property and prays for me and for this body. And I'm convinced. You can't convince me otherwise. I'm convinced that if we've got a body of believers who will do that for one another, there is nothing that God will withhold from us. But let me tell you, I don't know how it's going to play out. I don't know how all this whole pandemic and all this mess and politically and all, I don't know how it's all going to play out. And I don't know how it's all going to work. I talk to the staff and the council. I talk to them almost every week about, okay, we've got to get creative. We've got to figure out some ways to do the outreach. And, and, and Amy is working hard on Mother's Day out. And I'm going to tell you, that's going to be our next huge blessing in this church is because we're going to meet a need in this community through that Mother's Day out. And I, I'm convinced it's going to be a blessing for the church, but I'm also convinced it's going to be a blessing for those who are doing it. Amy, God is going to, I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know what he's going to do for your home. God's going to bless you. I'm convinced of that because of your willingness to do this. I'm telling you folks, God is doing something at Spirit Walk Ministries. But more importantly, God is doing something for you. And I just, I need to do this. I need, I need to do this. If you're here today, I, again, I understand social distancing. I get it. But again, the health of the body is comprised of the health of its individuals. Right? Am I making sense? So if there is someone in here who needs deliverance or someone in here who's sick or someone in here who needs a touch from the Lord, then this whole body suffers if there's an individual in here. And does that make sense? I hope I made that case at the beginning of the sermon. Are you with me? If you're watching by Facebook and you need something, please let us know. If you're in this sanctuary right now, if you're hurting, you're hurting. And we want to pray for you. We, we want to pray for you. And if you're not comfortable coming up, again, I get it. I get it. If you're not comfortable coming up, if you have a need, I want to ask you to raise your hand. But we want to pray for you. Hallelujah.